Hello everyone! Today we will talk about some of the most popular components. Some of them are still used by radio enthusiasts today, thanks to their excellent parameters. And let's start with diodes. In front of you is one of the most popular low-power diodes, the D226. This is a silicon rectifier diode. They were produced only in a metal casing and only in this form factor. The reverse voltage of these diodes, depending on the index, it could range from 100 to 400V. The diodes were rated for a current of 300 mA. They could operate in a wide temperature range from minus 60 to plus 80 degrees Celsius, due to the fact that their maximum operating frequency was around 1 kHz. They were used only for rectifying mains frequency voltage. The diodes were quite good for their time. The only drawback is their sensitivity to installation. They need to be placed at a certain distance from each other, otherwise short circuits are possible since the diode casing is metal. There were other diodes in this form factor as well. The parameters did not differ much from the D226. But there were exceptions. For example, the D237D diode. The markings DP and RUMB on the diode casing indicate that it is military grade. The diode casing is painted black. The paint provides resistance to corrosion and also, to some extent, insulates the diode, minimizing possible short circuits with neighboring elements. The reverse voltage of these diodes, depending on the index, range from 200 to 600 volts. And only the diode with the D index has a reverse voltage of 1000 volts. The average current of the diode is about 400 mA. The operating frequency is also 1 kHz. There were also such diodes in the Soviet Union, quite popular, by the way. These are the KD202 series diodes. The maximum operating frequency of the diode is up to 5 kHz. The reverse voltage could be from 50 to 600 volts. The diode current ranges from 3 to 5 amperes. The pulse current could reach up to 10 amperes. The diodes were produced in a metal casing with a screw clamp. The casing was the cathode, and the top pin was the anode. Both diodes and zener diodes were produced in such a casing. Thanks to the screw mounting, it was possible to install the component on a heatsink, which improved cooling and consequently the component's performance. Zener diodes in such a casing were a necessity at that time, as Zener diodes were often used as a full-fledged voltage stabilizer, voltages without additional amplifying elements, and Zener diodes are generally designed for low current. So, in the Soviet Union, they decided not to bother and made Zener diodes for higher currents. In modern electronics, Zener diodes with a power rating of more than one what are rarely used. This is due to the wide variety of integrated stabilizers for higher currents. But in the Union, the selection was not as extensive. In this casing, the Zener diode could dissipate up to 8 watts of power. And this means that powerful transformerless power supplies can be built based on them. And in general, stabilized power supplies with a power rating of up to 8 watts. Without using additional gadgets to boost current, such as transistors. But let's get back to the diodes. There were also relatively high power diodes in the Soviet Union. The most popular among them were the D245 diodes and similar ones. These are powerful 10 amp silicon diodes with a cutoff frequency in kilohertz. The reverse voltage of the diode is around 100 volts. In principle, there were also higher voltage diodes in the same casing. For example, the D245, rated for 300 volts. Both types are still in demand today. They are used for rectifying low frequency alternating voltage. The casing is metallic, sometimes even entirely copper. So successful that similar casings were used for thyristors as well, but more on that later. Silicon, pulse diodes of the K212 series. I'll be honest, I have many of these diodes, but I have never used them in a rail circuit because modern pulse diodes are much cheaper, smaller, and work better. And I haven't bothered these beauties yet. 
The casings of these diodes are designed so that the substrate can be glued or clamped to a heat sink. But to be honest, it's not the best solution. The average current of the diode is around 1. Reverse voltage is 100 to 200 V. Cutoff frequency is 100 kilohertz. Not the coolest diodes, but quite decent. And in this family, there were truly legendary diodes with such parameters that they can still give modern imports a run for their money. 8213. A powerful, 10 amp pulse diode. Very popular, by the way. In terms of reverse voltage and cutoff frequency, they are no different from the smaller one. The sibling of K212. But 10 amps of current, you must admit, is not bad. By the way, the pulse short term current could reach up to 100 amps. 10 amps is good, of course, but 30 is better. Mita D2997, diode 29.97, the most powerful of its kind. Besides being 30 amp, it is also fast acting. The reverse recovery time is only 100 to 200 nanoseconds. KD213 and 2997. KD213 and 2997 are still very often used today in the circuits of powerful pulse converters as output rectifiers. Without additional cooling, their parameters are not great. But with cooling, everything changes drastically. By the way, there was also an intermediate version, the diode KD2999, with a current of 20A, but they didn't find widespread use. Diodes KD213 and 2997, 13 and 2997, were very often used in power amplifiers. They worked there as rectifiers of alternating voltage from the secondary windings of the power transformer. The diodes were simple in design, compact, and had very good parameters. They were also used in military equipment. They were marked as 2D. In front of you now is the most popular Soviet TV, the Q202 which has excellent parameters and is still in demand today. Phase impulse power regulators or dimmers are built based on it. It is often used as a power element in homemade chargers, various light music circuits, and so on. The maximum switching current reaches up to 10A. The reverse voltage, depending on the index, ranges from 25 to 400 V. Based on these thyristors, hobbyists have constructed many things. Articles about DIY projects using such a thyristor often appeared in the pages of the magazine radio. In general, many powerful and good thyristors were produced in the Soviet Union, but they were usually not used in household equipment. Before you is the powerful power thyristor T171-320, 171, 320. In the USSR, they made thyristors much more powerful than my specimen, but unfortunately, this is the only one I have. This is a high-voltage thyristor, capable of operating in power circuits with voltage, 1600 to 1800 volts. In its nominal state, it can switch a current of 320A and up to 500A at maximum, and the maximum surge current can reach up to 10,000A. It operates in a very wide temperature range from minus 60 to plus 125 degrees Celsius. Such thyristors are intended for industrial use, and they weren't lying around on every corner. As a rule, they were complemented by a huge aluminum heatsink. The thyristor itself weighs about half a kilogram, and mind you, it's made of pure copper. Where were they used? Everywhere. Mainly in power automation systems, powerful switches, power regulators, rectifiers, and rectifier inverter converters. It can switch loads with power in the tens of kilowatts, but with appropriate cooling, of course. The connecting terminals alone command respect. It is stated to handle an average of 320 amps, meaning it can endure these amps for a long time. Not like modern Chinese components, whose leads start to melt even at half of the stated maximum current. Maybe not all Soviet components were good, but one thing can be said for sure. They did not skimp on colored and precious metals when creating them. 
Unfortunately, this video has come to an end. If you want more, leave a review and share this video with your friends on social media. In the next parts, we will look at more specific and rare radio components from the USSR period. Fortunately, I have a lot of them. Visit our vContact group where users and I personally post photos and radio components from that period. Join us as well. With that, I have to say goodbye. As always, this was Kasiana Ka with you, and until next time, goodbye.